Jed, there are a couple of questions here for you. Um, is melanoma systemic from the outset? In other words, does everyone who gets melanoma going to come see you for, for some of these investigational treatments? That's a really good question. Uh, I think the answer is no. Um, and I think the reason that we, we can say that with some confidence is the survival curves that, uh, that Dr. Coit showed you. Um, that there is the vast majority of, of patients in this country diagnosed with melanoma at a sufficiently early time that uh, it is still confined to the skin. Um, I think the, the, the troubling uh, statistic is that it's not 100% curable when it's diagnosed early. Yeah. And so there is a minority of people who have melanoma that does make its way into the systemic circulation uh, very early on. Um, and we need better ways to identify those people to, to move treatments into them faster because they may have, you know, a 0.5 millimeter melanoma and by the tables that Dr. Coyd showed you, those folks have an outstanding chance of long-term disease-free survival, um, but it's not 100%. And so how do we find that 2 or 3% and, and offer them uh, something different? That, that's a big challenge for us. Uh, Isaac, a couple of questions here about actinic kerato about keratoses. Mm -hmm. Can keratoses become cancer if they fall off? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so, uh, an actinic keratosis is something uh, that presents as a small, scaly, sometimes red uh, spot, frequently on sun-exposed skin, um, and it, we consider it sort of a pre-cancer. Uh, that's uh, potentially able to develop into a squamous cell carcinoma. So this is not a melanoma, um, but it's an atypical cell that's of the surface of the skin, the keratinocyte. And uh, people who have gotten a lot of sun exposure over their lives will frequently develop multiple actinic keratoses. And we do treat them uh, often by freezing them or putting on a topical agent. And the reason that we do this is that there is a small chance that they will progress on to become a squamous cell carcinoma. I have to emphasize that the number is small, but we don't know what that exact number is. Um, but it's well less than 1% of all actinic keratoses will progress. Will actinic keratoses go away on their own? Yes, they will. But a patient who has had multiple actinic keratoses is probably going to get more as time goes on. Um, so as I said, we do treat patients who have had sun damage, who do develop actinic keratoses. We tr either freeze them off or give them topical creams that help them uh, remove the actinic keratoses. And the idea is, again, to prevent the small number that will progress onto squamous cell carcinomas. Um, you're, you're, the, you're on the hot seat today. Uh, okay. There are lots of questions about sunblock. All right. Does I'm... sunblock really prevent melanoma? Um, is sunblock without chemicals, uh, i.e. the titanium and zinc, is that better than sunblock with chemicals? Can the chemicals do anything bad to you? Okay. So, um, I'm used to getting a lot of questions about sunscreen. This is not unexpected. Oh, and is there and a shelf life? Is there There's a shelf, shelf life? life yeah. Okay, so that's an easy one. Yes, buy a new bottle of, of sunscreen for at, at every sun season. So don't use that bottle that's been sitting on your shelf for four years. They don't put an expiration date on them, though. Um, but I do recommend that, uh, that you, if you're not using it regularly enough that you're running out, that means that you're <laughs> one of those hermits that's yeah. staying inside all the time. <laughs> When you do go out, if it's been over a year, buy a new bottle. Um, but hopefully you're putting it on frequently enough that you're running out and it's not an issue. Uh, do the physical blockers, are they better than the chemical blockers? No, there's no evidence uh, of that. Uh, the only thing I can say is that if you have sensitive skin that's prone to being irritated by things that you put on it, I would recommend a physical blocker over a chemical blocker. Personally, I use a physical blocker myself because chemical blockers have a spectrum which uh, depends on its chemical makeup. So not all light is being blocked by a chemical blocker, but physical blockers reflect all light almost completely. That's assuming it's put on thick enough to actually function. But they all work well 
They're all effective against UVB according to the SPF, and then you want to make sure that if you are using a chemical blocker, it's also effective against UVA, and it should say that on the label somewhere. Um, I saw someone asked a question about Anhelios, so I'll just say Anhelios is a chemical blocker that's available. Uh, it was approved in Europe before the United States, so there was a little bit of a fervor um, for people in the United States trying to get their hands on it, but the good news is now there is a form of Anhelios that's approved by the FDA here. You can buy it here. It's a broad spectrum, so it covers UVA and UVB. It's no better than any of the other broad spectrum uh, chemical blockers. Um, but it is an effective one, and if you have sunscreen with that, it's good. And then there was one more. Uh, uh, there, there, does it really protect you against yes. melanoma? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and can it cause harm? Okay. Um, the answer to those questions is we really don't know. If you Google sunscreens, you are going to find websites that will tell you that they're harmful. There is no good study that shows that they are harmful, but you will find plenty of web pages telling you they are harmful, just like you will find web pages that tell you that deodorant causes breast cancer and that drinking water is harmful. Um, so, but there are no scientific studies to show that any of those things are true. We do know from animal studies that applying sunscreens does prevent the damage that is associated with progression to cancer. There have not been any large controlled studies showing that treatment with sunscreen or use of sunscreen compared with non-use of sunscreen in comparable groups has a change in the rates of melanoma or any other skin cancer. So the truth is we don't have solid scientific evidence, but we have a preponderance of supporting evidence from animal studies, from epidemiological studies, and from application of basic science principles that says using sunscreen definitely prevents squamous cell cancers, most likely prevents melanomas and basal cell carcinomas. Personally, I use sunscreen because UV light is a carcinogen. It's been recognized as a carcinogen by the federal government, and I think protecting myself from carcinogens is a good idea. Um, there's a, there's a very interesting question here about um, insurance and is uh, our treatments covered by insurance. What I'd like to say is that virtually every uh, treatment in terms of screening and in terms of the original uh, and the conventional surgical management that I talked about is covered by insurance. But I, I actually wanted to turn this one to Jed because I think it's a, one of the most interesting questions we face here is what about these clinical trials, uh, are, uh, who, who pays for clinical trials? That's a good question. Um, I think that uh, the easiest answer is that uh, we do not charge for the experimental drugs. Okay, so when we present you with a clinical trial as a possible treatment, um, you get an informed consent document which describes, you know, what are the possible costs, and, it, and we're actually very careful to put in what your insurance will be charged for and what it won't be charged for. We try our very best to make it very clear that the only thing people's insurance gets charged for are standard care costs. So the cost of seeing the doctor, the cost of having an x-ray or a blood test that you would have had anyway. We do not charge for experimental drugs or experimental tests. So we make it as easy as possible for your insurance company to say yes, we will support your being treated here, okay? And I think the other thing that we want to emphasize is that we are very um, interested in having as many people as possible involved in clinical research. And so if your insurance does not cover you uh, for treatment here, we have a team of nurse case managers who will work with your insurance company to convince them that this is a good place for you to get your care. There were um, there are a couple of uh, other questions about basal and squamous cancers ever going internally. Uh, I think you can, we can say that confidently basal cell almost never, squamous cell very rarely. Um, but on the other, other end of that spectrum, there were three questions about Mohs surgery. Uh, and I think that, uh, that might be of some interest. What's Mohs surgery and do we use those for basal, squamous, or melanoma? Okay. Um. So briefly, Mohs surgery is a surgical approach where the skin cancers are cut out of the skin 
and then the patient stays in the office while the excised tissue is looked at under the microscope to see if all the cancer was removed or does the cancer go to the edge of the removed tissue. If it goes to the edge of the tissue, that means there are still cells left behind, so another uh, piece is excised from the skin in order, and this is repeated over and over again until all the tissue that is removed it has clean margins and we know that all the cancer has been taken out. Now, this technique of removing skin cancers is commonly applied to basal and squamous cells, not as often applied to melanomas, but there are certain subtypes of melanomas that occur on the head and neck that are sometimes treated with this approach. Um, but the long and short of it is Mohs surgery is a technique that has a very high cure rate because you know when you're done with that surgery that all the bad cells have been removed because you have looked at the complete margin of the excision. It's not necessary for the treatment of all basal cells and squamous cell cancers. In fact, there's specific criteria of which non-melanoma skin cancer should be treated with Mohs and which ones should be treated with a standard surgical excision or other surgical approaches. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of all those different criteria, but um, it is a very good technique. It has a very high cure rate, um, and you're confident at the end of it that you've treated the cancer completely, whereas with standard excision, you cut out the tissue, you send it to the pathologist, and you have to wait for that report to come back before you know if all the margins have been cleared. Um, regardless, uh, anytime you're diagnosed with a non-melanoma skin cancer, there will be a discussion of the appropriate treatment techniques that would be a, applicable for that situation, and a decision will be made at that time. It's a very individual type of decision. Jed, you had some questions about some of the uh, treatment of the more advanced patients. Yes. Um, one question asks, will vaccines be used as adjuvant therapy? Uh, and we hope that they will. They're experimental for right now, but we believe that the best uh, application for vaccines is as adjuvant therapy when there's only microscopic disease, if any. Uh, the same person asked, what about the new targeted therapies as discussed? And again, I think that we, uh, we're just at the beginning of our investigation of targeted therapies. Before we move something into the sure. adjuvant therapy uh, setting, which uh, as you know is the treatment of people right after surgery, and since those are people who may be cured with surgery alone, we need to make sure that what we offer those people is safe um, and effective. So it's possible that if targeted therapies fulfill their promise uh, of being very effective and, and not too toxic, uh, then we could move them into high-risk adjuvant setting, but I think it's, it's really too early to tell. Um, I have two uh, uh, very interesting questions. I've never heard this term before. Um, in benign melanoma, what percentage become malignant? Um, I don't think we use the term benign melanoma. I, whoever thought of it was, it's a great question. Um, in essence, every melanoma has the, once the diagnosis is made, that is a cancer. Uh, as we've talked about, uh, in situ cancer has virtually no potential, but it should be removed to prevent its progressing. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of a corollary question. If an in situ melanoma falls off, on its own, is everything okay? And I think the short answer to that is no, uh, that that should, have, uh, that should be excised to histologically, to proven pathologically negative uh, margins. We'd be a little bit unhappy about uh, the, natural, um, the natural resolution of that. Um, uh, there are a couple of interesting questions here about some of the techniques of, of uh, early diagnosis, including dermoscopy and a little more on the, on the digital photography and sort of some of the computer algorithms that are being used in mm -hmm. conjunction with that that I think uh, Dr. Brownell should address. Yeah, so the, these two questions kind of go hand in hand. Um, so uh, dermoscopy, which is the one where it's basically a fancy magnifying glass that we, we use polarized light and uh, surface contact in order to reduce the reflectance and see the deeper uh, layers of pigment network uh, is now broadly available and in fact many dermatologists are using it so it's not available just at Memorial Sloan Kettering but many dermatologists across the country and around the world are starting to use this technique um, although it is uh, in its infancy it is uh, progressing rapidly and becoming more and more common in your general dermatologist's office um, and then there was an interesting question asking uh, 
if the total body photography can be coupled to a computer analysis to compare for change. So you're not just relying on a set of human eyes, but can you have the computer look for changes over time? Um, and whoever wrote this question is thinking right along the lines of the people who are in this field because this uh, is actually being developed. And interestingly, it's not just being developed with the total body photography, but also the dermoscopy. So we have um, various programs now that are available, although not broadly commercially available, but are being developed to compare serial photographs to look for change over time, as well as to compare dermoscopic images to look for change over time, as well as to analyze dermoscopic images for all the different changes in the pig pigment network that we look for that would suggest an individual lesion may be malignant. Um, so all these technologies are rapidly advancing right now. There are companies all around the world who are working on this. Um, and I anticipate that within 10 years, uh, we will have sort of uh, melanoma or mole imaging centers where you will go in and have a, a slew of digital images and dermoscopy performed on you. Those images will then be analyzed first flush by a computer and then sent to a dermatologist or a dermatoscopist who will then do the final analysis on the ones that are identified as suspicious. And only at that point will you, will you then go in and see a dermatologist with a focused exam starting with the ones that were identified. This is a really a magnificent uh, advance of this uh, computer algorithms to analyze the digital images generated by this dermoscopy, and it's a very exciting field. A um, uh, couple of questions about uh, recurrence of very early melanoma. Um, can, it, can very early melanoma, when are you safe? Uh, and questions about second primary melanomas. One of the, when a patient has a melanoma, we advise basically a four-pronged follow-up uh, schedule or strategy. One is self-examination, and, and uh, Dr. Brunel has talked about that. If you notice anything on your body that's different or new, let us know about it. The second is dermatologic review. We've shown pretty clearly that if you have one melanoma, you have about an 8 to 10 percent chance of getting another one. If you have a second one, you have a 15 percent chance of getting a third one. If you have three, you have over 30 percent chance of getting a fourth one. And we're very cognizant of this, and in fact, our dermatology uh, colleagues uh, have high-risk clinics for patients with lots of atypical moles or history of melanoma, particularly multiple melanomas. Uh, the fourth is periodic imaging. It's not clear how important that is. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the third is the fourth is actually physical examinations by someone who's comfortable looking at lymph nodes, skin, and, and, and the like. And with those four things uh, uh, sort of all working together, emphasizing the fact that the patients are very much involved in their own follow-up, uh, we think we have the best chance of detecting recurrence. Patients with very thin melanomas recur very infrequently, but often many, many years after initial treatment. And that's one of the hard things, so that once you've had a melanoma, you have to be uh, vigilant uh, really indefinitely. Patients with more advanced melanomas, the events t happen more frequently and tend to happen uh, uh, quite a bit earlier. Uh, but in essence, late melanoma is a phenomenon, late recurrence is a phenomenon that's associated with melanoma, and, uh, and you have to be vigilant for a, uh, for a long, long time. Um, one. Yeah, Jed, one more I have for you. one that's yeah. related to that. Um, as a routine follow-up exam for a patient who has had non-metastatic melanoma, why is a blood test and a chest x-ray recommended? So this is sort of the, the, the low-tech um, approach to screening. It's not as fancy or expensive as a CAT scan, but for someone with a low risk of recurrence, it's actually very useful because one of the most common sites where melanoma can recur is in the lungs, and so a chest x-ray is a very economical way to screen for a low risk event. And then blood tests, uh, we, we really look for uh, abnormalities in liver or kidney function, which would be uh, a clue that there may be metastases somewhere in the abdomen. Jed, there are a couple of questions here, uh, and you alluded to it a little bit in your talk, about uh, the different types of melanoma. Melanomas that are, occur on the face, areas that are exposed all the time, melanomas that occur in intermittently sun-exposed areas like the back, and melanomas that occur under the toenail or in the 
uh, in areas that never see the sun, in the nose or the esophagus or the, in the rectum. What are we doing to try to figure out why these things happen? How can you get a melanoma that, without sunlight? I think that the, uh, the genetics are, are leading us toward, uh, you know, some answers there. And I think the identification of the C-kit, you know, is gene as being mutated is an important step forward. I think it's important that we recognize that all cancer is a result of a series of changes to our DNA. And since uh, it takes very many changes to, to actually cause a cancer, uh, you know, some cancers will, will develop with a change in one area of the DNA, others to, to other areas, and so it's taken us quite a while to break down all the different subgroups of melanoma by where the, the different mutations are occurring. Right. But I, I, and I just, to, just to expand on that, melanoma is not one disease. Melanoma right. is a family of diseases, and we're doing our best to put them into groups, but we may not have the groups quite right yet, and we're studying with these enormously powerful tools looking at the genes within the tumors. Remember, these are tiny little tumors. Uh, looking at the gene expression within the tumors, we're trying to figure out just how many diseases melanoma uh, actually represents. I think that's very important. I think the, the heterogeneity and the unpredictability uh, of, of melanoma is very important because I think, I think Isaac was the one who said it, that, or, or Dan, that when you get a diagnosis of melanoma, you automatically assume the worst because if you look on you know, Google, that's what you're going to see. But that's not true. Uh, I think that this is not a disease of statistics. This is a disease of individual people, and the only way we know how you do is by following you as an individual. And so it's, uh, it's very many diseases, and uh, that's why sometimes we give people chemotherapy, and someone will say, well, I read, you know, or I heard that chemotherapy doesn't work for melanoma. Well, maybe not for 90% of people, but maybe for 10%, it's worth a try. Right. And so that's why I think it's, it's important to recognize that this is a, a group of diseases that we're just beginning to learn how to segregate. I have some, these are actually some related questions. So there's a, there's a question about uh, melanomas of the nail bed, melanomas on the scalp, um, and then melanomas in, in populations that are, have darker pigmentation. Um, so it kind of goes into this whole concept of melanoma as a spectrum of diseases um, that all have the common feature of being malignancies of these pigment producing cells. And it can occur in the nail bed um, and it can occur in the scalp. Um, and if there is suspicion in any of those areas, you should be evaluated by a dermatologist and biopsies can be performed. Um, in non-white populations, melanoma still occurs. Um, there are some famous examples. Bob Marley died of melanoma. Um, and the incidence rate is lower, um, and it tends to occur in some of these special areas. Uh, so again, we're getting into the idea that melanomas occurring in special sites have different molecular changes. Um, but ultimately, uh, if there's something you're worried about, see a dermatologist, get a biopsy performed, and then it can be evaluated. And then the research can go on to further define the molecular changes that are involved. Oh, and, and I have just one question, Amy, yep. uh, and I think this is important for everyone, and it has a lot to do with cancer in general, and, a, and maybe a reasonable note to finish on. I have one question here. Is there a critical time uh, between a positive biopsy uh, and the definitive treatment of my cancer? And I, th this was posed in the context of melanoma. Uh, and I'd like to actually just finish by, uh, with, a, with a general statement, um, and one that I actually believe in quite firmly. Uh, as that it's better to get it right than get it quick. Uh, you'll all remember that story of the race between the tortoise and the hare, and you'll all remember who won that race. Uh, that, that I feel very strongly that, and I think probably most of you do because you've made the effort to come here tonight, uh, there's not a critical time. Most of these cancers have evolved over years, not days, not weeks, not months. Uh, and, and boy, it's better to get it right the first time. Uh, I can't overemphasize that. So if you, if you have, are confronted with a diagnosis of a cancer, I think it's imperative that you do your research, reach out to your contacts, find someone within your network that knows about this disease, uh, that's comfortable with it, uh, and, and, uh, and get it right the first time. The time is not the critical factor. It's getting it right, getting it right that's the critical factor.